How is it that we find ourselves surrounded by such complexity, such elegance? The genes of you and me, the genes of you and me, we're all made of DNA. We're all made of the same chemical DNA. you're listening to DNA Today, a genetics podcast and radio show. I'm your host, Kira Deneen. And DNA Today informs you on what's happening in the genetic world. During my broadcast here, I educate you, the public, on genetic and health topics through event coverage, book, movie reviews, and interviews like today. Guests include genetic counselors, researchers, doctors, patient advocates, and professors. So my guests today are the author of a new genetics thriller novel, Biohack, and a bioethics expert from the Center for Genetics and Society. So J.D. Laska is an author, Silicon Valley entrepreneur, and public speaker. He spoke at the United Nations in 2012 about how to use social media to combat global poverty, and has given talks on four continents, which is really exciting. His new book, Biohack, is a high-tech genetics thriller, so obviously it's very exciting for me to read and you guys as an audience. Dr. Katie Hayson is the program director on genetic Justice at the Center for Genetics and Society. She was an assistant professor of sociology and gender studies at the University of Southern California, and she's researched and written on reproductive technologies and women's health, which were definitely come in handy for the conversation we're going to have today. And you'll want to stick around till the end of the show, guys, for info on how to get a free copy of Biohack. So thanks so much for coming on the show, guys. Thanks. It's great to be here. Yeah, great to be here, Kira. So I do want to let the audience know, for full disclosure, I was one of the early beta readers for the book. I was lucky enough to be one of them. Um, and that was back when the working title was CRISPR. So if you guys know me at all, you know that I'm uh, kind of always referencing CRISPR and want to learn more about it. So um, after I read the book, I joined the marketing team. Um, so JD, can you give us a little glimpse of what Biohack is about? Yeah, I, I came to you first, uh, Kira, because I, I knew you were kind of crazy for CRISPR. Yes, so, that should be my title, Crazy for CRISPR. <laughs> <laughs> so Biohack is a story about the dawning era of reproductive technologies. It's kind of like Brave New World in reverse. Instead of the government deciding your genetic destiny, the free market prevails. On one level, Biohack is a kind of full-on pulse pounding thriller with a hero who's up against a villain who's a biotech company CEO running a next generation fertility clinic and they have the goal of ushering in the era of the new enhanced family. So it's set a few years from now in the mid 2020s when genetic science has advanced to the point where a lab can not only screen for genetic diseases like you read about in the news today but also they can add positive influences and genetic enhancements uh, to a pre-embryo. And for various reasons in the book, the bad guys begin to steal the DNA of celebrities in Hollywood. They start planning a grave team operation that, to steal the genetic remains of the most famous legends in history. But, you know, I didn't want Biohack to appeal just to science geeks like us, so you'll find lots of storylines that appeal to the heart and, and not to, not just to the head. So there's a 10-year-old girl caught up in all of this. There's the protagonist who's searching for her birth mother. And there's the mom who lost her toddler in a swimming pool accident and decides to use the clinic to create a new version of her little boy. So it's really a, a roller coaster of a science thriller, and I'm really happy to see the reception. It's getting more than 65 star reviews on Amazon so far. And hopefully counting after this show. Um, the, yes. I have to say, this the story isn't just for you know nerds like me, like you mentioned. Um, it really does appeal to a lot of people. And you've really tried to keep this in the realm of kind of science and near future science and straight away from that typical science fiction. What are some of these enhancements that you're talking about that people are able to request for their baby? Yeah, I decided that the book would be even more disturbing if it hewed as much as possible to what labs are doing today or possibly in the near future, and then let readers decide 
about the morality of it all. So I spent months doing the research before I wrote a single word. I was reading books like The Gene and A Crack in Creation and Remaking Eden, you know, titles that I'm sure a lot of your readers have read, and listening to science podcasts, reading about mm -hmm. clinical trials and thinking, wow, this is really amazing stuff and really society isn't ready for what may be coming just around the corner. So so I laid out this this new world, uh, created this elaborate campus where clients of the biotech company, Birthrights Unlimited, are able to trick out their test tube baby with all the latest enhancements ranging from eye color to hair color to skin color, you know, optimal body mass index or BMI. Um, but I wanted to keep it out of the realm of science fiction. So what they can't do by the mid-2020s is to greatly increase the intelligence or life expectancy of the baby. So a lot of the early enhancements are really superficial. Like uh, I have a scene where the identical twin boys on stage look exactly alike except for one thing. One of them has blue eyes, one of them has green eyes. And yeah, I actually can totally see parents doing that if it's left to the the free market. My nephews actually are identical twins. And I, I remember when they were little young boys, it was just impossible to tell them apart. So I would have liked to have seen that uh, technology in place. So the question, you know, really that we're going to be uh, delving into soon, I'm sure is, you know, where do you draw the line between parental rights and society's stake in making sure we don't create a sort of caste system for humanity? And so with all this, you were kind of focused on your book takes place in the mid 2020s. So that's not very far away. Um, you know, you've mentioned a couple of the different things that, you know, traits that maybe we're looking at. Um, what do you think would appeal to the public to actually, you know, be able to use if we're saying that, you know, this this novel um, is happening, right? Well, there's a, there's a fascinating marketing presentation <laughs> that takes place in one of the scenes halfway through Biohack where one of the lead characters lays out target audiences. So who, who would want to use these new technologies, right? So certainly uh, the gender, uh, selecting the gender of your child would be a very popular um, option, right? And actually that's already being done in some quarters today. Uh, women with breast cancer who want their daughters uh, born without uh, carrying the BRCA mutation. Uh, parents who may be self-conscious about everything from uh, their own big ears or red hair, and they don't want to pass those traits on to their child. Uh, even parents who maybe want to clone a child that they've lost. You know, that sounds like science fiction today, but, you know, the technology is actually here today. Uh, for that to happen. So, you know, I, you know, I think your listeners have to keep in mind that IVF and test two babies, which just came about 40 years ago next month, by the way, uh, they were once seen as morally repugnant in, in some quarters, these kinds of procedures. And now we kind of take all of this for granted. So if, if left purely to market forces, I think we're going to be seeing the same kind of evolution with reproductive technology. Um, I have an epigraph at the beginning of my book with a quote from the great James Watson, the co-discoverer of the DNA double helix, who said, if scientists find ways to greatly improve human capabilities, there will be no stopping the public from happily seizing them. And I think that's true. It is. And I think one thing that, you know, the public gets scared when there is something new in science. And that is, you know, history repeats itself. That's been true for, you know, so many years and decades that once we kind of get used to the idea and been exposed to it for a while, we get a little bit more comfortable with things, which is kind of what we'll start getting into if we should get comfortable or not. Uh, but Katie, I'd like to hear kind of what you have to say about, you know, from the standpoint of what kind of scientific advances with CRISPR technology that may be possible in the coming years. We've been talking about the novel Biohack, but now switching to kind of our world today and projecting into what could be, what, what could the technology look like and what could the bioethical implications be? Yeah, I think, um, you know, one of the things that's, uh, great in this novel is the focus on the market driving the use of these technologies um, and the scientific advances that are put into use. Um, and I think 
you know, when we start talking about what the the advances could be, it's important to to make a distinction really quickly between um, the kinds of of germline gene editing or reproductive gene editing, where you are uh, making modifications for future generations, and that would be passed down to generations after that, um, which is what is mainly discussed um, in the novel. But that's separate from the kind of um, somatic gene editing or gene therapy, where we're talking about um, using gene editing to uh, treat or cure someone who is already existing and, and who has a disease. Um, so, so thinking here about what might be coming, um, I think, you know, focusing on the way that the market might might push these forward through the fertility industry in particular is a really um, important thing to focus on. And it's where we see um, what we might call a new kind of, of market-based eugenics happening, right? Where we see the um, identification of traits um, tied to genes that are labeled as, you know, better and worse, and sort of dividing people into categories based on, on these genetics. Um, so I think that that is one place where we want to look at the, not just the bioethical implications, right, what are the, the rights and responsibilities of the parents or in relation to doctors or to, to researchers, but to think about um, what the implications might be for society if we were to decide to make this move of altering future generations, right? Thinking about um, the fact that uh, who would consent, right? Thinking about how we would make distinctions between uh, ways that we would use this, right? We, we hear a lot about um, sort of dividing the uh, therapeutic uses, sometimes called therapeutic uses, or the medical uses um, of gene editing from what's seen as more superficial or cosmetic or as a form of enhancement. Uh, but in fact, it's really difficult to draw the lines between those, um, those two poles, right? And, and who would decide? Um, who gets to have a say in that? Not everyone agrees on uh, what is considered a disease or a serious disease. Um, so there are a lot of questions that, that need to be discussed broadly by the public before we make any decisions about uh, going forward with reproductive gene editing. Um, and I think that's one of the reasons why we can't let the market uh, make those decisions for us. And it's difficult because this technology was really, um, well, it's, it's naturally occurring, which I don't want to get too much into that, but um, we kind of discovered um, this system back in 2012 which is not that long ago. So it's hard mm -hmm. to have the public have an opportunity and the time to be able to first learn about this and understand it, which is a feat in itself, but also then be able to have these conversations to see, you know, where we are. And there's never going to be one consensus. How often does that happen in science? But to be able to at least have those conversations out in the open. And I think one of the, you know, major points you brought up was kind of consent. If you're doing this, you know, to an embryo, that embryo has no say that will, you know, um, mm -hmm. possibly become a person. So, you know, a lot of things to consider. And, you know, I think as opposed to other episodes I have, these are a lot of questions that cannot be answered. <laughs> so if we're looking at kind of, you know, this market that we're talking about, oftentimes laws will kind of be put into place so that we're being able to control it a little bit. Now, U.S. laws don't cover the rest of the world, as we know. So do we think that some of these advances in genetic technologies are going to come from outside our borders where um, laws may be a little bit more relaxed or a little bit more strict, depending on where we're talking? Yeah, I'll jump in first on that. Um, so, yeah, I think that's a, that's a great question. I think we should be mindful of a couple of things. First, uh, just because there is a moratorium on germline editing in the U.S. doesn't mean it won't happen elsewhere, right? So um, you've got to watch what's happening in China and Russia and Ukraine or a country without the same kind of bioethical strictures that we have here um, and in Western Europe. Um, it's it's so already, you know, certainly within the realm of possibility that the first human clone that's allowed to come to full term is being created in, in a laboratory somewhere in the world right now, you know, because the technology is already here today. 
when it happens and it's going to happen, uh, I what I think we should uh, think about is, you know, don't expect the scientist or the client to hold a news conference uh, that their child has been born in a test tube and, you know, it's the first human clone because nobody wants to be the human version of Dolly the sheep, uh, you know, much less uh, the the next generation version of uh, Louise Brown, the first test tube baby, right? So a lot of this is going to, I think, it's going to come in through the back door. It's going to happen without us even knowing about it uh, publicly. Um, second, to, to Kira's point, you know, these advances in CRISPR technology are happening very quickly. You know, the CRISPR revolution is basically only six years old. So imagine what's going to be possible in another seven to ten years. One of the chapters in my book, Biohack, talks about how the genomics lab used to be where all the action was. But by the early 2020s, the real superstars are becoming the data crunchers in the bioinformatics department. Um, they're using quantum artificial intelligence to sort through millions of sequenced genomes to identify exactly where these gene regions are that, that lead to you know, uh, a full set of, uh, a full head of hair or how tall you're going to be or higher intelligence or a perfect body. So um, we have to sort of remember that we're just at the outset of this revolution. And um, even though we can't see where it's going to be going and we can't do much with the data right now, you know, that data is going to be be coming pretty fast uh, down the track um, after a lot more laboratory uh, clinical trials, uh, and a lot more data crunching where people sort of map, uh, you know, your genome to your actual um, phenotype, you know, how it expresses your, your itself in how you look and how you act, how you behave. Yeah, I think um, when we talk about um, laws in the U.S. And, and what will or won't happen in the rest of the world, I think it's important to remember that actually the U.S. is somewhat of an outlier in terms of its uh, treatment of reproductive gene editing. Um, we don't have a, a legislative prohibition. There are some limits placed through funding and through what the FDA uh, will or won't consider in terms of clinical trials, but there are dozens of countries um, that have uh, considered the question of whether we should go forward with inheritable genetic modification um, and decided to uh, prohibit it by law, right? Um, dozens of countries, many of which have advanced biotech sectors, and also that includes some international uh, binding treaties. So the U.S. and I think China are outliers in, in their stance toward reproductive gene editing. So we'll often hear that if there were stronger laws, scientists would simply go elsewhere to do this kind of work, right, to a place with weaker laws. But I don't think that is a good reason um, not to push for stronger laws here in the U.S. Um, you know, it does mean that we would need international cooperation um, and strong scientific norms, right, in line with this. But, um, you know, it's always the case that uh, you can go somewhere else, but it doesn't stop us from, from making laws when we've decided um, that we don't want to go forward uh, with a particular technology. Very interesting to hear that, I don't know if I knew that, that the U.S. doesn't necessarily have laws um, prohibiting people to do this research, but it's through the funding that they can't get funding for this research. But say someone is very wealthy and wants to start their own company and do their own research, you're saying that they, they could go ahead and, and research these things as long as they're not getting funding from the U.S. government. Am I understanding that right? Yes, that's true. If you have private funding, you're not covered by um, the restrictions through the NIH. But if you were to uh, try to start a pregnancy with a, with a modified embryo, that would fall under the um, FDA's rules about clinical trials, so you would be in violation of that, but it's not really as strong um, as, as an actual law, right, as legislation that, that prohibits uh, reproductive gene editing. So it may be possible that the U.S. and China would be front runners in this research since, you know, obviously there, there's different levels of this as we're talking about, but that there are ways to 
do research on this. And right now, you know, we cannot bring it to a pregnancy, but we can go as far as is that. Yeah, the, the research happening on, on editing human embryos has been mainly in, um, in China and in the U.S. as well as um, in the U.K., where it's uh, tightly regulated but has been permitted for specific research purposes. And one thing I do want to highlight that we kind of talked about earlier um, is that kind of the difference between editing an embryo with CRISPR and doing PGD, or pre-implantation genetic diagnosis. Um, and for those that don't know, um, that's when you select embryos that are negative for a mutation. So if we take BRCA, for example, the ones that don't have a BRCA mutation and are quote-unquote normal um, can go ahead um, and be used in, in, in vitro fertilization. Now, the difference with CRISPR would be to take those embryos and take the ones that are actually positive for a mutation fix them, and then be able to implant all of them. So if we're comparing these two, how does the bioethical debate really change if we're switching from just choosing the ones that are negative for the mutations to actually fixing the ones with positive mutations? Is it a little bit different? Is it a different perspective, even if the end is the same? Yeah, I think it is different. um, Because... One thing is that uh, one of the arguments that's often made in favor of uh, germline gene editing is that you would prevent a genetic disease from being passed down from one generation to the next. But as you've pointed out, uh, PGD already allows us to do that in the vast majority of cases. Um, So what we're talking about here is sort of adding another um, uh, technique that we don't know actually the, the safety risks or what the, what the health effects might be for that future child or for future generations down the line. Um, so we're introducing additional risk. Um, and then we are, I, we are adding the ability to, um, to choose to add traits, to control traits rather than selecting um, from, from what is already there. And, you know, PGD itself is, has a lot of um, ethical concerns around it, right? You're making decisions about uh, which children will be uh, allowed to be born, right? Which children will be welcomed into society. But I think that um, gene editing using CRISPR sort of uh, takes those ethical concerns and just multiplies them, right? Sends it us much further down the road um, and raises many more questions. And one thing that you mentioned is that we don't really know all the effects that CRISPR can have. In theory, it sounds great. Oh, you just go in and you fix the mutation. But, you know, when you're actually doing it, we don't know quite all the effects. And there is an article this week um, that kind of alludes to possibly elevating risk for cancer for, you know, CRISPR users and things. So we're not really sure all the effects. Again, we discovered this in 2012. This is this is really brand new. Um, and another ethical consideration um, when we're talking about CRISPR technology in the baby business market is restrictions possibly on what types of genes can be manipulated. At the beginning of the show, we talked about how, you know, different genes that may be um, disease causing could be edited. And but there's also other traits that are a little bit more Um, physical traits that are the enhancements that we kind of talk about. And those aren't necessarily two different groups that sometimes they end up getting blended together. Do we expect to kind of have restrictions on these or is it too hard to do that? Well, it's definitely going to be hard to do that, but I think that's part of what we have to do. And um, I liked what Katie said, and you said about bringing this discussion uh, to the public. So this really shouldn't be just within the realm of the scientific community because this really does affect all of us. Um, so I think I, you know, I differ a little bit uh, from Katie. Um, you know, I'm, I'm sort of of two minds about the uh, the the the, P, the screening uh, procedure that we we've just been discussing about whether or not that that. Um, goes down a slippery slope or not. You know, I, I don't see much of a difference between fixing something if you're guaranteed that there are no sort of side effects. So 
that there are no off-target effects of the CRISPR um, procedure, which we're not going to really be sure of for a few years until this is actually 100% refined. Um, but um, as far as the actual decision as to whether or not to open this up uh, to uh, beyond therapeutic use, um, yeah, there there are a lot of interesting discussions that are taking place in different kinds of scientific forums. In in uh, Siddhartha Mukherjee's book, The Gene, he's talking about how hard it is to draw that line. But I think ultimately society is going to want, uh, at, at a certain point when everything is you know, a little bit more clear when everything is, uh, you know, there's sort of a, almost a guarantee that this is going to work. Um, society is going to want to be able to go in and zap that one mutated gene so that you can you can pass on the the kind of traits that you want to your offspring. It's, it's just, I think, part of human desire to do that. And now it's going to become kind of difficult, but I think it's up to us to do it, to have that conversation about where do you draw that line. It's not going to be a bright line. You know, like my son, for example, has asthma. Um, that's not exactly a life-threatening disease, but I would have liked to have seen a procedure where I didn't have to pass it along to him, um, and he doesn't have to pass it along to his child. So where, so does that fall on one side of the line or the other? Probably it's not something that's so important that you have to actually uh, – go down that route to to cure that uh, in a test tube, but uh, there are other uh, diseases or maladies or, that are a little less severe, uh, sorry, that are a little bit more severe than so you might want to consider using germline editing. So, Katie, I'm sure you disagree with that, so feel free to break in now. I do uh, disagree, actually. Um I mean, I think it's important to have a clear place to draw a line and drawing a line between disease and enhancement is not something that we can do clearly, but drawing a line between, um, you know, a line that stops at germline gene editing is a line that's clear, right? That is one that we can um, agree on and enforce. Um, this, this line between disease and enhancement is so blurry um, you know, how are we going to define disease? Like, are, the way that we define the diseases that we recognize now has changed over time, changed in the last 20 years, changed in the last 100 years, right? But, but we're thinking about making, um, you know, genome edits that would, that would carry forward into future generations. Um, not everyone agrees on what a disease is. There are many um, in the disability community who do not see themselves as having uh, diseases that need to be fixed. Um, and is that something is that something that we would make a decision about for them? Um, what happens to uh, people with disability who will always have disability in our society? Um, and does focusing on editing it out actually reduce the resources um, that we have to to address disability in society? Even well, it thinking might, it, don't, don't, wouldn't it be interesting to actually uh, talk a little bit about this uh, article that came out of Ukraine on NPR in the last few days? Because basically this goes to the same issue, doesn't it? Mm. Go ahead. Well, there was a a woman in Western Ukraine who actually went to a fertility clinic. She was not able to have children on her own. So they did a procedure using a third party's, another woman's mitochondrial DNA as part of the procedure that allowed her to actually give birth to a child. Um, and the upshot is that the child has uh, DNA from three parents, the father, the mother, and the donor uh, surrogate. Um, so um, the question is whether or not that is the sort of thing that falls under the the kind of rubric of ther therapeutic usage of reproductive technologies that, you know, would be looked upon askance. Um, you know, I, I can see in principle how that is a good principle stand and a bright, easy line to draw. But for for uh, parents who want their own biological child, you know, it's kind of hard to make that case to their face. I think that, you know, this uh, 
case in the Ukraine is really an interesting example because this, these uh, mitochondrial manipulation techniques um, have been presented, for example, in the UK where they've had a debate about this and decided to um, go forward with allowing these, the three-person IVF or um, mitochondrial replacement techniques um, in cases where uh, the risk is to pass mitochondrial disease um, from, from the mother to the child. Um, and it was you know, proposed and approved on this basis that it's a, that it's a therapeutic use. Um, but really what we're talking about, as you said yourself, is uh, maintaining that genetic connection to both parents, right? Which is not in and of itself a medical issue, right? That's more of a social issue. It has to do with um, how we value genetic connections in our family. Um, and so, you know, when we move to looking at this case that just happened in the Ukraine, we're already seeing the kind of uh, indication creep or the slippery slope in action, right? We're moving from the idea that, um, that mitochondrial manipulation is for uh, preventing passing on disease to the idea that we're expanding it to um, uses for infertility, right? Which is actually a, a huge leap. Um, and I don't think that that aspect of it is really getting enough attention. Uh, this, these are techniques that have not been studied very well. Um, you know, we haven't seen clinical trials. Uh, so, I mean, we have reports that the, that the babies are doing well um, which is good, but we, we really don't know, right? And we're moving forward with this kind of experiment, right? Um, and starting to use it for things that, that don't fall under the rubric of um, serious disease that's, that's mainly used to, to promote the use of these technologies. Well, you both definitely um, highlight a lot of different things from both sides, and I'm kind of glad that you're from opposite sides, I guess, of uh, the issue we're looking at. Um, I think we'll leave it for the, the listeners to ponder over. And if they want to join in the conversation on Twitter, um, you can tag me at DNA Podcast and we can uh, kind of see where the conversation goes from here. Um, before we end the episode, I did want to let you guys know about a special giveaway we're doing for the novel we've been referencing, Biohack. The first 10 listeners who sign up for JD's Best of Indie email list will get a free copy of the ebook plus the Hacked Celebrity Files, which is a really cool full color PDF outlining the Hollywood celebrities and historical figures that are targeted by the biotech company um, Birthrights in the novel, Birthrights Unlimited. Um, and so you can go to birthrightsunlimited.com slash DNA today to enter. If you can't wait, you can go on Amazon and search Biohack. And it'd be great if you leave a review and share on social media, as I mentioned, about today's episode and the book. Um, I really want to thank you both for coming on and having a different kind of episode where we're bringing up a lot of different issues and taking, uh, you know, different angles and looks at things. Yeah, it was great to, to have this discussion. And I hope we have a lot more discussions as uh, an informed public about these issues, because uh, this, this is, these issues aren't going away anytime soon. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, thanks for the opportunity to have this discussion, Kira. And thanks, uh, JD, for joining in. Yeah, thanks, guys. And if you want to learn more, you can go to geneticsandsociety.org. And as I mentioned, birthrightsunlimited.com. And if you're looking for that giveaway, go to birthrightsunlimited.com slash DNA today. All episodes are at dnapodcast.com. I mentioned earlier my Twitter is at DNA Podcast. Instagram is at DNA Radio. And questions for today's show, there, I'm kind of thinking there might be some. Um, you can shoot them over to info at dnapodcast.com, and I'll forward them to the appropriate person if I can't answer. So thanks, guys, for listening, and join me next week to learn and discover the new advances in the world of genetics. The genes of you and me, the genes of you and me, are all made of DNA. We're all made of the same chemical DNA.